Hi, welcome to the fourth episode of Conversations here at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. My name is John LaRue. I'm the manager of collections and exhibitions here. And it's my great pleasure to welcome a good friend of the gallery and a very important young emerging artist in New Brunswick, Emily Grace Lavoie, who is a wonderful sculptor and we've worked together for about the last two years. Uh, you came kind of in the Beaverbrook family working with us on the New Brunswick Art Bank. Uh, project a few years ago, so she's also a curator, uh, wonderful writer, but I think one of the most important uh, young sculptors in New Brunswick today, working in clay with a voice that is absolutely unique. And so it's a real pleasure to have her. And of course in conversations we talk about a work that's in our permanent collection. And so just last year, this is one of our newest works uh, within the Beaver Collection, it's called Azure, and it was done in 2019. And uh, as you can see it's glazed ceramic, and it is, uh, it, it's, it's typical of, of Emily's work, uh, something that's got a sort of an edgy kind of biomorphic form, but we're going to speak about that in a little bit. So we're very, very pleased to have it here and to have Emily here. Hello. So bonjour, bienvenue. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Emily, uh, as, a, as a young sculptor, uh, you know, you're working also as a professional in a bunch of different things as, as, you know, young artists have to do, but you really do have a serious studio practice. Can you tell us where your interest in, in art came from? Uh, you know, I know you graduated University of Moncton a few years ago, but um, tell us where your interest in art and in, certainly in clay sculpture developed. Yeah, well, I think uh, my interests begin with fashion design because uh, I studied fashion design first. And then after, when I was done with uh, that uh, course, uh, I went to Moncton, uh, not really um, thinking I would be studying in visual arts, but I followed uh, drawing classes and art history classes. And then this was something that interests me, like the creation and being emerged into like a different world or creating your own world kind of thing. And then I enroll in the visual art uh, department and I, it's kind of like a, a, I wanted to um, uh, enroll into the photography class, but it was full, so I took ceramic <laughs> just because it was like the last the choice. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and I, at that time I was not even think. I was just thinking like, what is ceramic class? I like for me, ceramic were uh, ceramic tiles. For some reason, I didn't even thought of pottery or anything like that. So it was like a really, uh, without knowing what to expect. Uh, in that class and uh, it, it just like became something I really enjoy uh, doing wow. and also uh, for the my teacher Jerry Collins was really passionate uh, artist and I think uh, she had a positive influence on me as well so that's great do you think uh, having no expectations of this because you created something which really a unique language I mean and I say that it's not even just simply for for these videos you can tell an Emily Grace Lavoie work, you know, and there's no one that works like you. And do you think you developed it because you didn't have these preconceived notions of what ceramic art should be? You know, did it come from invention of just, well, it can be kind of anything? Could it, could it have been from that? Yes, yes, maybe. I think, like, uh, I think that the fashion world really influenced me or like working with textile because it's, it's sort of like a, a f flat material and then you transform it into something you can wear three so it, yeah. yes it becomes three dimensional and uh, with the ceramics I work with the slab ceramic slab so it's kind of the same like not the same process but it's the same like a flat material that you sculpt and transform into something three dimensional mm -hmm. and I feel like I have uh, maybe an ease with 3d forms versus 2d like, uh, so I think, yeah. It fell into place. It, yeah. Well, plus you also use some textiles in some of your work as well. I mean, Azure is, is purely glazed ceramic and, and sculptural and it stands on its own, but some, you also work on some wall pieces with, with textile and, and sort of felt and pieces coming down. Does that, is that a kind of a pullover from your, your fashion studies, do you think? I think so, yes. Uh, that is a process that I uh, began exploring while I was doing my master uh, in fine arts in Vancouver at Emily Carr. Mm -hmm. uh, really trying to um, uh, use ceramic, but how to transform other material into ceramic. So I use uh, natural cotton and dip it into ceramic um, slip. Slip? Yeah, the yes. kind of liquid clay. Yes, right? liquid yeah. clay, and then 
when, uh, into the process, like the textile it absorb the ceramic, uh, liquid ceramic, and then when it goes into the kiln, the textile disappear, and the only thing is like the, the skeleton of the textile remain, but it's only the clay, and it's, uh, it, it's a bit more fragile, but it's, it's kind of like echoes with the textile and you know how to transform that. And then the, my last year in the master's program, I started integrated other material than ceramics. So playing with textile and or creating not just object, but pieces that could go on the wall as well, like trying to explore space, how to um, yeah install or uh, create like sort of like more of a, an experience for the viewer to how they encounter the work as well. So, well, I know your exhibition that we had here last year, your your solo show. Uh, this was part of it, but it was really interesting because it was uh, the work was so alive and it did that. We we had sort of one wall, which was kind of the main installation, but then we had these individual pieces set throughout the gallery, and they would have these dialogues with our international, and it worked amazingly well. Though we had to. <laughs> People were touching it. I remember one, one patron. Oh, you shouldn't! Don't don't touch the ceramic. Um, but uh, this piece in particular, because of, of the blue and the scale of it, we placed it next to our 18th century ceramic porcelain collection, which we've had since the gallery opened in 1959. And there's one section a lot of people know it. It's sort of the the chinoiserie, the you know the Dutch and British blue tile, or sorry, blue blue ceramic work, which is influenced by China. And then you had this piece right next to the case. And it was amazing, the dialogue it had with the old. It was this sort of new young punk child. <laughs> but it knew those were its parents or grandparents. And they worked amazingly well. So I guess with that long introduction, um, is the, was the blue in this particular piece, which I love, was it a bit of a homage to that sort of traditional use of blue glaze, which was coming from Chinese pottery and then the Dutch 17th, 18th century work? Uh, kind of, yes. Um, like uh, when I did uh, my master again, uh, I started also breaking rules. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that. You always I learned, break rules, you do. I do. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, and she so <laughs> uh, when I did my bachelor, like uh, um, they told us not to mix clay together or that the, this color in particular was the easiest color to have in the electric kiln. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started using recycled clay, which is a mix of all the leftovers in the studio uh, back in Vancouver. And then with that uh, piece, I, I thought I should use cobalt blue because I never did the piece with that color just to see. And then I, I did, and when it got out the kiln, even some other artists were telling me like you should maybe uh, do like a sand blasting so it it tones down the color. But I kind of like it because it's it's not a, a color I would use usually because that's what I was taught it not to use it or that okay. it's easy to oh to really do. it's too easy well yeah. that's right because you tend to have sort of earthy kind of, you know, coppers and sort of browns and grays and that kind of thing, you know, yeah. more, more, uh, you know, kind of underwater kind of creature colors and stuff, which I think promotes you right. And I think maybe that's some of what drew me to this one as a bit of an anomaly in your work. Um, tell us about this one though. Tell us about Azor, you know, where, where it came from, because it is, it is a little bit unique in your work. I mean, it, it has some of those um, sort of almost fin like um, kind of sculptural bits of almost fabric poking out, but that are that are actually somewhat sharp. But then it also has those those extrusions. It has a lot of things going on that you see in sort of bigger scale in some of your other works. Yes. Well, with that work in particular, I started to be uh, interested in the object and the parallels between object and their aliveness, like just an object itself, how it can demonstrate some kind of aliveness or, or depending. something that's inert that is obviously not living, how it can yes. feel alive. Yes, exactly, okay. yes. And with this one, like with the structure um, in the bottom, it's like a, a referring like of an object, like the reference of the, of the object, and then as if like uh, it would be habitated by life or some some kind of like something mysterious that just grew on it mm, and okay. then like as if it was like underwater and then we could um, like lichen or barnacles or something that's all of a sudden on it yes okay. but it's not 
maybe like uh, forms that we would necessarily like recognize because some of them are more geometric and some of them is more like uh, organic mm -hmm. and so it was like playing with that like uh, almost like transforming a man-made object into something that echoes like some kind of aliveness or that life could continue growing from that uh, piece. Well, that's really interesting because I think maybe that's why some of it was so successful being the adjacencies with the earlier porcelain because a lot of our earlier stuff, it was influenced by Baroque. You know, it was kind of late Baroque, which is very much sort of the shell, this kind of really organic, just over sumptuous nature of, of just form and flows and curves. And there's some almost like kind of, those sensibilities are in this, but it's, it's much more kind of, kind of controlled chaos in a way too, which I, which I, which I really like. Yeah, there's sort of exploding. Yeah, I, I keep kind of looking at the side of my eyes, <laughs> waiting for it to start kind of walking away. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, could, and yeah. they sort of only half joke about that because it feels that way. So yeah. in your mind, I mean, I don't want to get metaphorical on this or, or, or even metaphysical, but do you feel like it really is sort of alive, that it's, it's more than just exuding, or do you feel it as a, a, like a living piece? I think so, yes, yeah. Like sometimes I did the exercise when I was in Vancouver because I read, I read a lot of uh, Jane Bennett theory, like of uh, vibrant matter and uh, thing power, how certain objects have sort of a life, mm -hmm. and or how um, when we collect objects or everything that surrounds us, like tells a kind of a story. Mm -hmm. And so every time, like sometimes I, I place my ceramic, like not on a, a plane, but somewhere else, a gen C, like uh, next to other objects, mm -hmm. like random objects. And it, it does kind of feel like uh, they yeah, have there's an energy. To yeah, there's a connection. Yes. Well, also, when we showed other ones around the gallery, we had one next to the Dali because there was one that had the sort of horns. It felt very Dali esque and it was kind of subtle. We don't have it right in the middle, it was just kind of quietly there and it was quite remarkable the power that it had. Um, there's two others that you had which I want to talk about from the exhibition which, which relate, you know, formally to Azure. They're, they're much larger. Um, one of them was called uh, Speciosa from 2016 and it's a, a, a tall white kind of figurative piece um, you know similar in some ways to this but um, but it with with legs and so on and that piece won you a silver medal at the Jeu de Francophonie in uh, in Africa right in 2017 and those are real medals. The Jeu de Francophonie they have an art combination as well so beyond the athleticism that that are like the Olympics that win medals it, literally you won a silver medal at that tell us a bit about that yeah. well uh T uh, do you want me to talk about the piece? Or oh, the, sure, yeah, the, about yeah. the piece as well, sure. Yeah, well, that piece I did uh, my last year during uh, my bachelor degree in Moncton. And um, during the summer before that, I tree planted. And um, I did tree planting. And it's, it's kind of like this relationship, like, with nature. I kind of uh, begin interested in, like, um, genetically modified uh, organism or things like that and it kind of like uh, um, I emerged myself into this research like with the ocean how 80% uh, of life is underneath the, mm -hmm. in the water and how with like all the chemicals going into the water how like not necessarily like it's the end of the world and things will die but how would like everything morph into something else or uh, we could see new kind of species and I used like this kind of like a, a way of thinking to create that piece and it's kind of like a human figure. It's sort of humanoid that turns into something different yes. up above. Yeah. When you look at it like uh, from the, the, the feet up, <laughs> you recognize the human feet and then there's like the algae and like all the corals and then slowly uh, you see the barnacles have like Barbie legs coming out because mm -hmm. the barnacles uh, eat with their legs, but that's Barbie and Barbie legs, uh, like human legs, but also like plastic reference. Mm -hmm. And then the algae slowly transform into fabric because I left the um, imprint of fabric on clay and sort of like uh, maybe a, a critique to the fashion industry, how it's the second most um, of the wasteful yes things, yeah. industry and how um yeah on top of that is just a pile of fabric on the head 
And it's kind of a way to try to imagine a mutant, like a new sort of species, human, animal, a vegetable figure, mm -hmm. and yeah. So there's some, and, and that's, so there's some social commentary. I mean, not that it's really a political piece, but there's elements of it, of thinking future, what, what do we as humans, how does that manifest itself on, on how we treat our environment? And you're expressing those things through, through the art project. Yeah, and yeah. it's sort of like exploring the unknown, really, because mm -hmm. we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other piece, which was quite remarkable at the time, and I love the story behind it, was the large purple. I love the glaze. I mean, again, I love the cobalt blue, but the, the sort of very, uh, very strong purple glaze of this other one, I, I want to make it right, it was Symbios from 2017, this sort of almost <laughs> kind of melting piece, but it actually did, it was actually a technical failure when you made it, that you turned into strength, right? So that's, that's a great story. Yes. Uh, that one I did uh, for the interim thesis exhibition while I was doing my MFA and uh, I was having a discussion with one of the professor and she told me why don't you do like a really big piece built directly on the floor of the kiln like the gas kiln and I was like huh but how will I transport it after and then she was like after you just destroy it you just know that you you made that really big piece and you know you document it and then you destroy the piece. And so I was like, huh, I'll try that, you know? And so I, it was like a month. I, it took me a month to build that gigantic piece. Absolutely. And it was made with recycled clay as well. Something I was taught not to do, to like use, like it's a white clay, red and black clay all together. And like those um, bodies of clay do not uh, dry or they don't, uh, they don't. Or they shrink or they yes, it, at the yeah, same, they same don't, rate. Exactly, okay. or they don't sh shrink the same. And so it can result into cracks or morphing into something else and I thought I wanted to take the risk because anyways the piece would be destroyed and so I, I built that piece and then it went into the kiln like the first um, fire for the bisque and everything survived there was a little crack but I was not too worried and then I glazed it and then we put it again in the gas kiln and then I was with the technician at the time and then he looked into the little uh, you know, there's a, a little, little porthole, so yeah. Yes. And then he was like, uh-oh, I don't see your piece anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> so it and disappeared. Then it just disappeared and he was like, it must have like morphed. And then he, were, he, he told me like, this could be a problem if it morphed uh, like on the, 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 on the, the wall, because then the bricks would stay attached to glade, like to the piece. And then he was like, if that's the case, you'll have to buy new bricks. And I was like, oh my God, this piece will cost me a lot of money. <laughs> and the next day, I, I needed to take it out the kiln for the exhibition. So I thought, like, I won't have anything to show for the, for the exhibition. But the next morning when I got to school, it just morphed into something I thought was was exactly what I was reading with Vibrant Matter because the, the piece became alive. It became something else like I could never, like some, some of the forms I knew I could not do. Yeah, you could never and, create that. No, it's sort of like yeah. almost this kind of sleeping sort of tired piece. Yes. It was, it was, it sort of, but it, yeah, it, it was like a slumped cake. Yes. It was down on itself, but it's, yeah, you could never create it, it was on, intentionally, but it was this happy accident. It was. It's beautiful. It was, yes, and it was like, sort of like on the floor, and it, it kind of echo how I felt as well, like <laughs> so, so tired, tired yeah. and just like, yeah. Huh? But when I, I show it into the, the, the show, I was kind of proud still of that happy accident because then it got me thinking of something else and you know, it, it, everything always like one thing leads to another yeah. and so, uh, but I never destroyed the piece, but. No, and we showed it, it's a yes, wonderful piece. Yeah. And I think those, so sometimes things can work out sort of as you planned, which are wonderful and not, and, and they, they, they absolutely relate. Well, listen, this is, this is wonderful. I mean, I, I really think so much of your work, and, and I love to see it evolve. I know you're working. You've got a lot of, uh, a lot of shows coming up in commercial galleries. You're doing well. And, and as I said, we're so happy to have this in our collection. When we do reopen, I think I do want to show this again uh, on a plinth next to the porcelain, because it just seemed to work well there. So this will be up when we reopen. But um, what, are your, what are your future plans for your exploration for your next series hmm. of works? Yeah, well, right now I'm, I'm trying to explore other 
medium, like maybe playing with 2D, but like uh, just because I like to explore out of my comfort zone, mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, 2D is not a comfort zone for me, and so kind of like uh, put myself into this uh, challenge, and so I know this will whatever that that looks like will influence my sculpture, and then I'll jump back into sure. making ceramics, of You'll course. You'll always come back to this. Yeah, oh, that's yes, great. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Emery, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. C'est toujours un plaisir. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. great. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and please, when we reopen, you will get to see Emily Grace Lavoise Azur on, uh, on display here in our gallery. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Bye-bye.